I'm Jim Collison and live from our virtual studios around the world. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on July 7th, 2020. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. And I think that will be the last time you hear the word maximizer on the program today. <laughs> if you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. That link is uh, just above me there on our live page. Uh, check in. Let us know where you're listening from. If you're listening after the fact and you have some questions, you can send us an email, coaching at gallop.com. Don't forget, if you're on YouTube, there's actually a subscribe button down below there. If you subscribe to the live page, you get a notification every time we go live. Just make sure you never miss one of these. And of course, you can listen to us as a podcast. Just search Gallup Webcast on any podcast app. And Linga Felter is our host today and is a learning solutions consultant with Gallup out of our Sydney office. And and I say this every time, but I kind of wish I was... Even though it's a little chillier, I kind of wish I was in Sydney with you guys today. Welcome back to Call the Coach. Uh, thanks, Jim. Look, um, we always wish you were here, too. We were hoping that you would have that visit. I have to say I was missing um, the U.S. this last week um, over 4th of July. Uh, had a little bit of a celebration here. We tried making a pumpkin pie. We tried making an apple pie. Uh, and and even though it's winter, um, it's not too bad here in Sydney. So we had a pretty lovely day. Um okay. But uh, yeah, one of these days we'll get you over here and we'll do a live call to coach with you uh, from the Gallup office. So looking, looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, Jim, I have wanted to do this interview for quite some time. Um, and then last month, Accenture received Gallup's Don Clifton Strengths Based Culture Award as part of our 2020 annual summit. The award recognizes organizations that put the strengths of leaders, managers, and employees at the core of how they work every day. Today, I am fortunate to be joined by Chairman and Managing Director of Accenture Australia, Bob Easton, and Talent and Leadership Lead, Claire McCaffrey. Claire is also a Gallup Certified Coach. They're going to bring to life the story behind the award, how it started, what happened, and where to now. Bob and Claire, welcome to Gallup's Call to Coach. Welcome. Thanks, Anne. Really happy to have you guys here. I, Bob, one of the first things that I heard when I first met you for the first time was that you were one of the reasons that Gallup was partnering with Accenture around this. And, and I do want to get into that. And I'd love to hear about, you know, you for you to tell the audience about your time at University of Pennsylvania and all of that. But I want to go back because I know that your real experience with strengths began before strengths with a capital S. It was really about just strengths in general, from something that happened back in your um, it, it, in your history that 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 sort of um, gave you a, a I guess a, a love or an interest in in strengths with a capital S. So, um, if you don't mind, start off by telling our audience your top five and and a bit of that story um, when you were in the army. Okay, uh, thanks, Anne. So my, my five strengths are maximizer, learner, strategic, command, and individualization, which is uh, an interesting set of uh, an interesting set of strengths. So, yes, I, I told you the story the other day. So I was in the army for twenty odd years. I joined the army when I was fifteen years of age, and the army is a pretty, from a performance management perspective, pretty direct, uh, and uh, you, you often get. Uh, told all the things that you're doing wrong. And I, I remember I was uh, I was an instructor at Officer Cadet School and uh, I went to get my annual performance review and the uh, the colonel in charge was a Colonel Bob story. I, I, I don't know whether Bob uh, is still alive today but because it was a long time ago. But he gave me the performance review and through the entire review, he uh, focused on my strengths and what I was good at. And I noticed this and I said to him, but Colonel, you haven't told me anything that's wrong with me and uh and what i need to improve on and he said well bob he said i believe in focusing on uh what people are good at uh, and what your strengths are and he actually used the word strengths because he said those you can elevate uh whereas your weaknesses uh you should leave and get people uh around you that can help with those but for now what i want you to do is think about your strengths and how you can improve and maximize on those which uh, got me thinking for for quite some time, and has and has really uh, has really stuck with me. And I saw Bob about uh, ten years ago at a reunion, 
and I thanked him for that. And uh, he got pretty emotional about it when I told him the, you know, the impact that it had, had on my life. So that was really the, the sort of first start. And it tells me, you know, just how big an impact someone can have on you when they focus on your strengths and what you've got to, and remind you of that, as opposed to telling you all of the weaknesses and things that are wrong with you. Yeah. And how did you, from many years ago when you were introduced to that concept, how did you, when did you first start bringing that into the workplace? Well, I think from, I started trying to do that, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it sort of stuck with me. Um, unfortunately, like many people, I have uh, a range of uh, things that I need to improve on and I, I'm not always good at that. But uh, my hope and, and ambition is to try and focus on that when I have conversations with people. So it sort of stuck with me. Uh, I, will, I will admit that uh, at times I do get, uh, we're sort of drawn to focus on weaknesses. And so you have to challenge yourself to do that. So um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I think from that day on, I've tried and I've tried to understand more about strengths and I've tried to actually live with an affirmative strength-based approach. Uh, but I'm not always successful at that. Sounds like a maximizer to me. <laughs> Somebody who's definitely wanting to, um, uh, to to go from from good to great. So um, what about you, Claire? Um, let us know a little bit about you and your your history with strengths before we get into the the nitty gritty of 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 strengths at Accenture. Sure. So I mean, just my top five, like individualization, so the same as Bob. <laughs> um, Relator. Strategic, same as Bob. Um, <laughs> arranger and learner, same as Bob. So we've got three of the same, but two quite different. When I actually did my first strengths um, survey, it kind of made sense to me. Like, you know, I'd always thought of myself as a bit of a chameleon. I could work with different people from different walks of life, different backgrounds. I didn't really understand what that was. So when I looked at my strengths, I was like, that makes so much sense to me. Um, even my strategic thing, my kids always used to say to me, Mom, you're going too fast. I don't understand why, you know, when I try and teach them their homework. <laughs> and I understood that actually that was really helpful to think about being mindful about your strengths and your talents. Um, because sometimes, you know, you having a talent, other people can be left behind. And so um, doing that first survey was really impactful for me. And then I was given the opportunity to go to, um, to Malaysia, actually, to get trained as a strength coach. And at the time, I mean, I've been in HR for 20 years. And so I thought, this is great, great opportunity. I, I love to learn, learn is number five for me. Um, but it was really, that was all it was. You know, I thought I'd go and do this and learn about strengths. But I came out away thinking, wow, that is, that's really impactful. And I want to figure out how I can be a really good coach, how I can take the knowledge I have around strengths and actually really translate it into supporting and helping other people. And um, that was when I, and I, when I talk about this and I really truly mean it, I, it changed my life. It changed my career, but it also changed my, the path of my life because it made me really interested in coaching. I signed up to do my master's in coaching psychology at Sydney University, which has literally been transformational for me as a person um, and has made me the person I am now, which, you know, when I talk to people at work, they say, oh, yeah, Claire, this, you're the coach, you know, so it's it's helped me to figure out what is it what my passion was actually and actually then be able to realize it because with the support of Accenture not only only am I doing an HR role but I'm also coaching um with strengths which is which is amazing so the journey is 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 incredible and it's not only impacted me it's impacted you know people that I coach but also my children I've I've got a strength grid <laughs> for my whole family um my all my children understand their strengths um and they talk about them and they recognize them and i think that's 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 the star you know um my daughter and she's happy for me to talk about this after a coaching session she actually decided she was thinking about which university what she should do and she had it in her mind she was going to do um one subject i think she's going to do english but then after coaching, so she said, Mom, I've got learner number one. I just really need to be having something which I'm it's 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 making me learn all the time. And then she she shifted towards science because she felt that was more aligned. So that's how impactful strength can be and has been for me anyway. Yeah, fantastic. 
Bob, I'd love to hear a bit about your academic background in 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 and what happened at UPenn and even some of the other work too that you've done around trust and well-being and at Case Western Reserve. Um, can you share a little bit of that, please? Uh, sure. And um, well, I've always had an interest in, uh, but you know, but a learner. You know, I joined the army when I was 15 years of age. I didn't even uh, graduate from high school, and uh, you know, I started. Uh, I had an epiphany at a very early age to, you know to to want to learn so i started studying and ended up doing a business degree first and then a postgrad in psychology uh i think i started reading my first psychology books when i was about 13 or 14. i don't know what it was that interested me in it but uh but then uh i think it was 2012 2000 between 2010 and 2012 i had i had a lot going on in my life uh and uh i decided to sort of get back and try and uh, understand a little bit more and I went to I was lucky enough to go to UP and I was living in uh, in Princeton at the time uh, which is not too far away from UP and to the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology where I was just very lucky to spend uh, you know 12 months of that uh, time with an amazing group of people with Martin Sedwickman and a number of others uh, learning about positive psychology which had a very uh, big strength bases, and uh, I started working with David Cooperider, who is really the father of appreciative inquiry, and uh, did my capstone project on trust and the connection of trust to well-being, um, which uh, which I'm happy to, happy to talk about. And from that, uh, sort of my learning, my learner took over, and while I was working, I decided to go to Case Western and do the PhD, which I, I'm sorry to say, I still haven't finished. All my <laughs> colleagues that have joined have. Have, uh, have finished, but uh, I finished all my coursework. But I, I was studying uh, flourishing organizations and really uh, you know, my, my, my focus was on trying to, to look at uh, measuring collective flourishing as opposed to individual flourishing. And, and during that time, I, I had uh, a one semester, I, I took some time off and I went and studied 11 amazing organizations in the US doing some quality of research where I talked about, where I uh, you know, talked to them about, uh, I surveyed about 52 people, uh, four to five people in every organization. These are organizations from uh, 500 people through 90,000 people. And uh, Gallup was one of the organizations that I, I was lucky enough to interview people there. And what really came through in that was the connection of the importance of strengths and trust and well-being and that whole, uh, that whole connection. Um, yes, and, and uh, you know, I continue to, I continue to, when I find time to work on my research and when I retire, I will make sure that I complete my uh, my uh, my PhD. But uh, you know, learning, I'm every opportunity I get uh, to read or think, and uh, I do that. And you know, Accenture provides a sort of applied laboratory to see what's uh, <laughs> the, the application of this. And uh, we're just lucky enough that we work in an amazing organisation that's set about to try and create the most truly human organisation in the digital age. You know, we can talk more about that if you'd like. Absolutely. It certainly seems like a perfect fit um, for, for both you and Claire. But I have to stop and, and ask you, Bob, please to give a little bit of context for those who are listening or watching about the size of, of Accenture and, and I'm talking globally, and then also the responsibilities that you have here in Australia for your team of what, 5,000? Um, I mean, when you're talking about the extent of research that you've done, the study that you've done, and then your other, then your day job, I, I wonder if you ever sleep. But I, I, I think the thing that's most impressive is that um, if, you'll, if you'll talk a bit about about Accenture and, and give us that context. And then really to talk about how in a role as senior as yours, um, you've been successful in bringing in what are your underlying passions for for this, you know, truly human um, uh, organization. Yeah, so let me just uh, go back one step because uh, I, I do have to, I do have to say that when I was at uh, UPenn, and this will sort of catch with the connection of, uh, of, of Gallup, when I was at UPenn, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, meet Tom Raff. Tom Raff came in, and uh, and this was this was uh, I think uh, ch life changing for me to to listen to Tom talk about strengths. And I got to I was lucky enough to get to, to talk to Tom afterwards, and that sort of uh, that sort of was what made the connection between uh, Gallup and I. But you know, Accenture is uh, over five hundred thousand people, um, and uh, 
just an amazing organization that's growing rapidly and uh, working with all you know many of the largest organizations in the world solving complex problems we have people from all over the world so it's a very diversified uh, culture we call it a culture of cultures uh, in Australia I was I was lucky enough to, to uh, be asked to lead our business in Australia about three and a half years ago four years ago now actually and uh, we have about 5,000 people here on shore so inside Australia and New Zealand uh, serving our clients here and about 9,000 to 10,000 in offshore locations supporting our clients here so um, yeah you can imagine it's a very fluid large uh, diversified organization with uh, what I would say a culture of cultures and uh, we'll talk about Accenture I feel very humbled to be here today because uh, I was only one very small cog in this you know very large organization and uh, we're just lucky to have uh, the leaders that we have really the whole truly human movement was uh, first inspired by um, our global CHRO, Alan Shook, and, uh, and our CEO who, who passed away, Pierre uh, Nantern. Um, they're the ones that actually sort of started the catalyst for creating the truly human movement. But our, our, you know, our aim is to really, we're a very high performance culture. So um, our organization is all about uh, high performance. And uh, we can talk more if you if you like, Anne, about the connection of high performance with uh, sometimes what people call this soft, uh, truly human uh, side that we're trying to create. Um, but uh, but that, that's that. Does that answer the question around the sort of size and complexity we are? No, absolutely. And I I think that that's such a a key a key point to say that you know you can uh, being truly human and being a high performing organization can coexist um, and. And so if you, if both of you could talk through that process about how you've made that so at Accenture, what you've done uh, through performance achievement, through uh, inclusion starts with I, through truly human, all of the different, pro well, they're not even programs, right? They're just ways of being, um, the ways that you have tied um, those concepts into your systems and processes. So yes, if you can, either one of you, Claire, Bob, Claire, why don't you, why don't you? Sure. Start and yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll add, you I'll can add. add on. I mean, look, yeah. it certainly starts with our values. I think if you think about, I mean, one of our key values is respect for the individual. Um, and I see truly human is, is about thinking about a person as an individual, their whole self, what, what they bring, what they need. Um, and that's why well-being comes into that as well. So it's, it's broader than what you do at work. Um, and that's what Truly Human is really about. It's actually about understanding people, understanding, having conversations with people, having meaningful conversations. And that's what performance achievement was originally about. It wasn't really about changing a performance management approach. It was thinking about how do we pivot um, to actually be more aligned to the way the world is moving you know, being more agile, being more focused on purpose. And if you, and I know a lot, a lot of the studies that Gallup have done around millennials shows that, you know, millennials are just looking for purpose. I think my view is most people are looking for purpose. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I think performance achievement was actually around that. It was around um, how do you actually focus on the individual? How do you focus on people, but then thinking about more broadly in their teams? So it started with yourself. It started with reflection. And strengths is an amazing way to reflect on yourself, to be mindful about yourself and think, what are my talents? Um, how do I need to pivot those talents? So it's not, it's not, strengths isn't about your, you do everything well, um, there's no issues. Strengths is actually around understanding what your underlying talents are and then thinking about how do you build on them? How do you invest in them? And when I do workshops, that's what I talk to people about, like talent times investment equals strength. You know, when you talk about when you look at athletes, yes, they're talented. They have to invest a lot, and we in Accenture have to invest a lot to, to build our strengths. So I think that's critical. Um, and then thinking, then how do you take that to your teams? You know, so once you understand yourself, how do you then expand that to your teams and make it more systemic? Um, and I actually, the way we did that was really thinking about, okay, we've got our strengths, but then how do we measure engagement? And that's where Gallup came in, I think. The opportunity to partner with Gallup to say, well, we can actually measure engagement now. We used to do just, just these big, you know, cross 
across company surveys, but actually doing it at the level which engagement happens, which is at the team level, I think is is really helpful. And I, I love um, I love the the line which um, I I learned from Gallup, which was around: "It's not about raising the numbers; it's what the numbers raise. It's having a conversation. It's having a meaningful conversation." And most things start with 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 conversations. And I think if you have good conversations, quality conversations, it influences the organization. It influences systemically. So um, that was what performance achievement is about. That's what truly human is about, is actually thinking about people holistically, thinking about them as, as, as human beings, understanding their strengths, helping them focus on themselves and on their teams. And then, you know, taking action because, you know, it's, it's, it's all about growing and, as a coach, one of the things I know is that the, the way that you help people develop and grow is actually keep them accountable, help them to grow, help them to have some action plans. You know, like it's all very well reflecting, but if you don't come out with anything to say what is going to change, things don't change. So um, that was really part of the journey, and I think they they work perfectly together in in terms of those those two approaches. Bob, I mean, yeah, so. What you want Maybe if I pick up on build on some of those themes. So Accenture had a long-standing performance management model and, uh, you know, as I said before, a very high-performing business culture. And as the nature of our work and workforce was changing, we found that the performance management model needed to change and it needed to better accommodate a, a very diversified business model, shifting demographics and generational mindsets and uh, the increasingly global and digital workforce. And in 2014, the question we asked ourselves uh, in the course of our performance management discussion was how do we help the people of Accenture achieve their best performance, which is very aligned to uh, to positive psychology in terms of how do we help people, uh, uh, you know, be the very best they can be. And the answer to that question wasn't in any existing model or traditional approach to performance management. We had to shift the conversation from systems and processes toward a very focus on the individual and uh, so we set about to reimagine our performance management system. This is sort of how we got uh, focused on, on strengths that would enable at that time, 400,000 employees to have personalized experience around strengths. And uh, so we went about uh, said, you know, some research. We had a, a team and this, you know, I'm humbled also to be here because I'm just one small cog. There's a whole team behind this of uh, people that just set about to make the world better in Accenture. And uh, within Accenture and then through Accenture, through the connections that we make, uh, there's a real vision for us to really improve the way the world works and lives. And this is uh, this is one way to do that. And uh, we knew that what we needed to do was root whatever we did in what we call universal strengths and science. And uh, so a team of researchers set out and through that, uh, they came up with uh, what they called sort of universal truths. And we found that uh, based on the research, uh, that great performance happens when we bring uh, the best the best of who we are and what we do by firstly, uh, and there are five or six things here, understanding, so when people understand their strengths and the application of their strengths to their work, have clear expectations in their roles and focusing on a few pivotal priorities. And if you, as you listen to these, think about uh, the Q12 and the sorts of questions, have meaningful conversations uh, you know, during the performance process create engagement within teams and take a forward looking uh, actions for growth instead of catching people doing something wrong and, uh, you know, uh, focusing on what they've done wrong. It's about focusing on what they could do. That's what we call it achievement going forward. And that led to uh, what I what, what really stuck with me is the truly human uh, high performance DNA culture that was uh, that was sort of architecture that we created and there were four components to it. And uh, Claire's touched on some of them. The first one was uh, con our conducts counts, which is really the table stakes around our values. So it's living values like uh, integrity and respect for the individual. Um, and uh, and the second the second one was uh, around uh, performance achievement, and and we recognised that uh, we get the best performance when people are able to operate at their strengths and those strengths at the intersection of their strengths and their passions. So what they're good at and what they're passionate about, which comes back to purpose. And when those strengths are under challenge, because strengths that are not under challenge atrophy. And so we said, uh, you know, we get great performance when we have people operate at the intersection of their strengths and their passions. Those strengths are under, uh, yeah, under some sort of challenge and are connected with meaningful conversations around them. The, 
The third element was the well-being um, and truly the truly human, so mind, body, spirit, soul. And what we recognized was that actually to get, uh, you could get high performance, but to sustain that high performance, to sustain the, the, the leveraging of strengths, you needed to make sure you looked at the whole person and you created, uh, you know, culture and tools and processes and language that would enable uh, people to operate at their best, have their best level of well-being. And the fourth element was leadership, uh, having the leaders really focus on uh, walking the talk because it starts with leaders you know, right down at the, at the manager level. And uh, there's no point the leader looking after their well-being and having operating at their strengths uh, if they weren't uh, actually enabling that for those that they lead in their team. So conduct counts, uh, performance achievement, and focusing on strengths, um, well-being, and uh, and leadership. These were sort of the four components. So they all come, they all connect together, and that's why I think you can see through that end. Uh, a very strong connection between uh, the hard driving, high performance culture and what people would say, these soft um, uh, elements of uh, looking after people, helping people strive to be the best they can be. And what we recognize is that these things live, these things are symbiotic. I, you know, high performance culture is enabled through, uh, is enabled through helping uh, people be the best they can be. Mm. No, fantastic. But, you know, I, I love, I love, of course, um, you're preaching to the choir here. Um, but, you know, when we talk to a lot of folks, they often organizations will say, you know, love your research, love, love the the idea of a strengths approach. Um, it's, you know, having these ongoing conversations, these constant conversations in, in time conversations um, makes a lot of sense, but it often will go in the too hard basket because, you know, where, where is the time? How do you find the time to, to do that in a busy world? Um, I'd love to hear how Accenture has done it because most certainly um, uh, high performance, as you say, is, 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 is a huge focus for Accenture and you and 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 a result. I mean, you guys have been um, hugely successful. So, can you talk about Claire? Can you talk a bit about you know what is what does strengths coaching look like at Accenture? What does um, you know we're talking about? I think the the last data point I saw was over three hundred thousand current Accenture employees have taken their strengths. Um, and then what? You know, how do they get? Um, do they get coached on that? You know, how, how does that then go into the system uh, or into the process? Um, and Q12 the same, right? Hundreds of thousands of people are doing that. Um, Claire, can you talk a bit about the, the more granular steps? When people come on board, um, you know, our new hires, everybody does their strength survey. And I think, as you quoted, Dan, 300,000 of our 500,000 people globally. In Accenture, that's 84%. Um, of people who have done that and so mo it's it, we get a lot of take up with that we do that actually as part of the integration process so we actually get them to do their strengths in the integration process and then we have a session within integration our, our new hire integration process where they actually talk about strengths so um, we get automatically some buy-in because they have to do the survey as part of their whole process and then they, they talk to their peers about it. So that's the starting point. And then after that, I mean, it, it varies. The journey varies. Um, we do offer strength coaching and we have coached um, and Gallup have also done some coaching for our managing directors who managing directors get, get offered a coach as soon as they come on board. Um, but we, there, there is a sort of network of strength coaches within Accenture. I'm one of them. Um, there's uh, a few more of me in, in ANZ and um, we offer strength coaching. We started off with more at the, the, the leadership level, um, but we've been expanding that now and to people who want to be coached. And so I often get requests to be coached. I think I've, myself and a few other coaches have coached most of the HR team, but we also um, offer that more broadly. So there's individual coaching. But we also build strengths into many of the programs that we do. So, for instance, we have many leadership programs. Um, when you get promoted, for instance, or in high potential, um, or we have a program called Leading Extraordinary Teams, which are truly human extraordinary teams, which is all about actually building leaders and managers of the future. We build strengths into all of those programs. So it becomes in the vocabulary. So people understand strengths. They talk about it. They discuss it. They um, it, it's something that is is very 
normalized, I guess. And actually many people, including myself, put it in the bottom of our email signature. Um, I mean, one of the first things I do when I start a new team is I get people together and say, okay, let's look at our strengths in the grid. What's amazing about performance achievement as a tool, we actually have a tool around performance achievement, is you can actually set up a team in performance achievement and you can pull in everybody's strengths and see them in the grid immediately, as long as they've accepted the team. So that's incredibly powerful, to be honest. And that's something that we teach to our, to our managers and to our leaders. And every time I do a coaching session with an individual, I'll say to them, well, have you got a team? And they usually say, yes. Have you gone through the strengths with them? Um, no. Then I encourage them to you know, go and talk to your, your individual, your counselee about their strengths, but also look at your the team strengths and think about how your strengths come together. And that is where it becomes more systemic, I think, when you can actually get that sort of ripple effect um, where people are taking it and, and translating it into their teams. So it's it's quite broad. The other thing we've done is a sort of digital strengths journey, which I think globally 100,000 people have taken, which helps you walk, work through, walk through your strengths. And we've also linked it to other important programs such as Truly Human and, and our leadership DNA. And so for instance, we've got a whole site where you can actually look at your strengths and how it relates to our leadership or what we call DNA, to the leadership behaviors that we expect and, and how you can focus on your strengths to support building some of the leadership DNA. So by building it into programs, we're making it more systemic, I think. Um, I mean, that's strengths generally. And then when we think about the Q12, or we call it the Q14 now, because we've added two more questions, which is the engagement survey, bringing that together with strengths br brings the power. You know, I love looking at team grids, but then looking at engagement, you know, so, you know, you might have a, a team of learners who the opportunity to grow is quite low. Obviously, you know where to focus, <laughs> help them get some training, help them get some, some you know, new opportunities to grow. So um, actually having that as well, and that's also in performance achievement, really gives us a bit of power. I think people are amazed, actually, when they see how easily we can do that. And that's something I'm trying to get out to everybody. This is this is a tool that everybody can use. It's really powerful. If you can use it with your teams, you can actually build teams, look at their strengths, look at engagement so easily and actually have conversations around it. And I think that's that really makes a difference. So those are just some of the things that we do. Um, we've also actually activated um, what we'll call a stre the strength core, or ar like, like an army core. Um, so they're a group of people who are passionate about strengths on accounts and things like that, but they're not strength coaches. We've given them some training um, and a situation happened the other day where one of the M managing directors who was in that, one of the strength core that, sessions that we ran, um, contacted me and said, I'm doing some follow-up sessions. I really want to get deeper into strengths. Can you give me some other exercises? Because, you know, we talk about strengths all the time. And, but we want to understand how we can bring it to life a bit more. And that was probably a year after we'd done the initial session. And that, I mean, that's what I call the sleeper effect. You know, it's like you, you did a session a year ago, somebody's still taking that forward with their teams, working through it, how it can be impactful, how it can use strength to, to reach goals in a team environment. I mean, I think that's where you see the difference. So, but I mean, we are a big matrix organization. I think one of the big challenges is how do we get to everybody? You know, how do everybody know about this? You know, we've got people on clients who, you know, they're very head down working on on the accounts, you know, and some people might think, oh, haven't haven't got time to think about this. Usually, what I find though is when people do think about it, they get really engaged with it and really interested in it. But it's just opening their mind, having the time to think about it, and saying this is a priority for me. I think. Mm. No, 100%. But I, I think um, one of the other things that I, as I was preparing for this interview, I happened to jump on YouTube this morning and I watched the video, um, Inclusion uh, Inclusion Begins With I. It starts with and I, yeah. It, yeah, it starts with I. And and it's um, if if you're watching or listening to this and you haven't seen that, I suggest that you go and and look at it, audience. Um, but it's you know there's so much about Accenture that's really focusing on you know equity, on diversity and inclusion, um, and 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 I think 
what what I was struck by is strengths is another way to do that. And certainly we talk about identity diversity and we talk about cognitive diversity, identity diversity being who you are when you walk in the room, right? Are you male or female, young or old? Um, but cognitive diversity is where strengths lives. It's it's where it's, you know, everyone has different patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior. Um, and so if we can put some language to that and start to include folks who think differently than we do, um, then then we can have great results, right? M more, more innovation, that sort of thing. I, do you see that, Bob, playing out at Accenture? Um, do you see strengths being used sort of in that way? Um, I, 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 I do, but I think it's in combination. We have a, a number of programs for that. Um, you know, as I, if you think about those four things, the leadership uh, focus on inclusion and diversity is uh, great. But I think what by having conversations around team strengths and opening people up to understand that cognitive diversity, um, I really think it starts to open up uh, and unlock some of the unconscious bias. Uh, so I think it is a it is a very good tool for doing that. And I know, Claire, you have some perspectives on this. Maybe you want to share those. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see this every time I do a strength team session, which I do quite, quite a few of. And often I'll find that a team will lead with a particular domain like relationship or influencing. And, and when you look at the grid, you'll see these commonalities and people go, oh, look, we're all this, we're all that. And um, but then you might see someone who brings a point of difference, someone who's quite different to the team. Um, and you often do that and often look for that you know, because I think it it brings that diversity, that cognitive diversity, that it, it moves away from group thinking. So, for instance, a good example would be you might have a, a, a team who are really, really strong in Relator. Now, often I see that, you know, Relator includes generally lower down on the list, but you might have someone in the team who's it's number one for them. You know, I really like to explore that. How does that person bring their includer into the team? What do they do? How do they support the team? What complementary partnerships? Um, the other one I, I often see a lot is harmony and strategic, you know, which often if you're high in harmony, you're lower in strategic. And you see a group of, you know, people very high in strategic. Harmony is, you know, could be quite low, but then you've got somebody who's got harmony number number one or something like that who really bring the team together, look for the different perspectives. Um, if there's a real power in that and when people see that and then and they, they start I love actually those complementary partnerships I love the fact that people start celebrating each other's strengths and saying oh yes you, you know you're really like that I can see that you bring that you, you really help us do that in the team and that happens over and over over again the power of those conversations is is, is so important yeah. um, and generally every time I do one I come out and, and somebody will say to me afterwards oh that was just so helpful to understand other people. And I know that part of actually high performance team is actually understanding each other. So that's that's the first part. So that's what I see as cognitive diversity. It's actually bringing different strengths. When you know, It's kind of a relief to think, I don't have to be good at everything. I can have different strengths in different areas and other people can help me. You know, like recognizing what you're really strong at, partnering with someone else who's strong at something else, it's, and it's, it's a relief. And then everybody's happier because everybody's playing to their strengths, so they're more likely to be intrinsically motivated and and passionate and engaged. Mm -hmm. And how do you guys know that it's working? I mean, I hear your anecdotal stories. I hear you talking about the you know the the sessions that you do, Claire. But as far as as the you know, is there some data out there? Do you guys um, have you done some business impact analysis to see that the investment and the time that obviously has been immense has is making a difference? We have, and we work with you <laughs> to do that, uh, <laughs> which has shown that you know people have done their assessment more likely to to stay, which is which is really impactful, and also people have been coached actually are more likely to stay and 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 in and also i think we some analysis around engagement so people who actually have the opportunity to grow looking at some of the engagement questions um, are more likely to be engaged so we've we've seen we've done some of that analysis uh, from a qualitative perspective i think we also do see some you know just from the numbers of you know we still have people who who want to do the, the the q12 we still have people who just the uptake on our strengths i mean especially in australia it's like 84 percent and i know that's probably from the process but we do see follow-up on that and then and then i think there are many um and stories though which 
more of the qualitative things which which I hear all the time as a coach and often you know like I might coach somebody might have been two years ago you know and they come to me and say well that and I can I can I know a particular situation somebody came to me and said to me that coaching session we had nine months ago it 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 made me think about my role and what I was doing and I realized in the wrong place and so it helped me think about what what is it what is my passion where where is it I want to be and moved roles within Accenture but they found their place and, and were really happy so some of those stories they're more difficult to measure <laughs> but as a coach you hear them a lot I mean I I coached a team um and I came out of that session and I thought that one of the people in there wasn't very engaged and he came up to me afterwards and said I really realize now I actually need to think about my each of my individual people and the different needs they have and the different strengths they have rather than just you know just applying a one size fits all and this is what I'm going to do um, so some of those I like to call them sleeper and ripple effects you know they happen all the time you hear them as a coach so yes we've got high in input uptake um, we continue to coach people people continue to, to love it but I think it's it's some of the stories that that we hear that make the difference to me and make me give me the passion to keep doing it to be honest because I do it it's not my job <laughs> it's my plus one job um, but um you know, every time I hear one of those stories, I think, well, actually, it made a small difference in someone's lives and helped them think about something differently or or grow in a small way. So, yeah, maybe Anne, maybe uh, I'll build on some of what Claire said. So, I mean, I think even though we've been on the journey, what about uh, five or six years now? It's still it's still relatively new, um, but we we think that. Uh, you know, the response to strengths and performance achievement has been, you know, very positive. Uh, the qualitative findings that we have is that, you know, strengths provide a framework for people to bring the best of who they are and what they do. They provide compelling language that has been critical to our culture change. Teams find new ways when you, when you, when you, when you build strengths uh, into teams, they find new ways to build trust and align work for maximum impact. Our people have more frequent forward looking actionable conversations. Uh, talent and reward decisions are improved. Mm -hmm. You can see, is it working, the adoption numbers? I think actually 409, last stats I saw, 490,000 people, Accenture people have taken strengths because some people have you know, come and gone. And then there's the, the business impact. Uh, we are studying, you know, studying that. We, we've still got more work to do on that, but we do see uh, you know, correlations with uh, higher retention and performance rates for those uh, focused on strengths than... Uh, we see um, correlations between the adoption of strengths and performance achievement behavior and key measures like uh, retention. Um, now, I know when I look at uh, when I look at the the sort of I, I asked Gallup uh, probably six months ago, how do we in Australia and New Zealand get to be an A? And uh, I looked at some of the data you know, related to uh, you know the studies that you've done around the connection with uh, sales performance. Uh, retention and so forth. Um, these are all pretty hard. There's there's you know real scientific evidence over time that you've shown the the, the relationship between uh, you know direct business impact. And I know we have that. It's just that we still need to we still need to uh, study that some more. And we are doing that. Yeah, I think it's pretty remarkable, really, um, when you look back at the timeline of when this was introduced, given the the you know. Um, how enormous Accenture is that that they were able to you know go through the research and then through the piloting and testing and then rolling it out um, to such a large population so quickly because I think when I looked at your timeline it was something like the the initial rollout official rollout happened over just 12 months which is huge um, and then to have it continuing to um, to grow and change and be brought into the priorities to be brought into you know the different things that are um, key to to you know your high performance um, is is quite something and I also like the fact that your focus is very much on progress not perfection and and certainly that's um, you know that's a great attitude to take um, it does take time doesn't it um, mm. as you yeah, look maybe. back at it sorry go ahead well, I was just saying yeah, it might be good for some of your listeners to, you know, if I just sort of outline quickly the sort of stages that we went through. So there was, an, there was an experimentation stage. 
uh, then we did employee centric design. Then we had agile releases. You know, and, and, the, and the, you're right. We said progress versus perfection of both experience and technology. Then there was immersive training. We started with senior leader training, and uh, then there was sort of the surround sound uh, of, of transparent employee communication. You know, uh, multi channel social. Uh, the, the sort of champions networks that Claire's referred to. And we did adopt this mantra of uh, of progress greater than perfection. And if you look at the timeline, it was sort of October to December 2014, there was a research sprint. Then uh, January to May 2015, we we prepared experiments. Then uh, you know, the next sort of three or four months, we did some experimentation. And then uh, you're right, by uh, December 2015, we did a, a full launch. And that began with immersion sessions with senior leaders. And throughout 2016, uh, you know, and then on and beyond, we we started, you know, driving this and uh, infused over 17, 18, 19, we infused the whole performance achievement habits, strengths and behaviors into our ways of working. So it's been a it's been a, a journey, as they say, the the you know, the first steps, the, the journey starts with the very first steps. And um, and, you know, it's. So whilst we, whilst some people, we didn't actually achieve it in one year, we got it kicked off and launched in one year. When you look at the uptake now and the number of people that strengths has impacted over 500,000 people um, and uh, the impact that it's had on our culture, um, it's been quite dramatic over this time. And we, you know, we have a long way, but the connection of strengths and the whole true to human movement with our values and our leadership behaviors has been uh, sort of uh, a really critical step in our development and evolution. Excellent. I know that Jim Collison is going to join, come back and join us, and he's probably going to have some questions from the folks in the chat room. So before he does that, I would love to um, understand what's on the horizon. So um, what's next for your strengths um, and engagement work? Um, can you give us a glimpse as to where you're headed? Clear. What I mean, I can, I can touch that one. Um, and I think it is a journey, you know, so I love the progress of perfection, which is what we've talked about. Um, what I love about it is it also is the fact that it's four years on and we're still talking about this, still using this, right? Um, but we know that it's, you know, we're, we are in a big, complicated matrix organization and it's hard sometimes to reach people. And so we want to think about how we can reach more people. So the way that we're planning to do that is through focusing on our accounts. So we're starting with our large accounts. We've actually done a number of sessions already with some of our larger accounts, looking at strengths, looking at leadership, looking at strengths across the team as well and, and how they compare, looking at engagement um, to look at benchmarks, then also looking at the small teams as well within those teams. Um, so that's, as I say, we've done a couple of those in, in A and Z at the moment, and we're looking to expand that further. Um, and I think continuing to embed strengths and engagement into, into our everyday vocabulary, if you like, and everyday processes. I've really got a passion around developing the manager. I know its manager was a, was a key book for Gallup last year, and I really re uh, resonate with that. And actually really helping and supporting our managers to become better leaders is, is another thing that we're looking at. Can we um, give them more of a deep dive into their strengths to help them build their teams? So Bob, I know you might also have a perspective. Oh, and I think you've covered it there. Um, you know, for the for the listeners, a significant portion, over fifty percent of our uh, people and our revenue comes from a very small number of uh, very large accounts, what we call our diamond uh, and platinum accounts, and yeah, you know, they they just have very large numbers of people. So here in ANZ, for example, we have two very large accounts, and those uh, the two that have actually started to do this, where the account leads are. Um, uh, working with uh, both engagement and uh, and strengths, and we know when we get it out to those big people, there'll be uh, you know there'll be a ripple effect through everything else. And I I was having a conversation this morning with one of them, and one of the managers. This is how it sort of starts. One of the managers uh, created something called Project Courage, which was having the courage to be your best, to strive to be your best. And uh, I mean, when you you know it's working when you have managers uh, that are that are working for that. And I think um, from it's the manager. Uh, that book, which I, I, I love, that book. Uh, and for for those that haven't read it, you've got you've got to read it. But I think 70% of the variance in team engagement is determined solely by the managers, and the managers can be as small as five people. And uh, uh, you know that that I think the research that Gallup's put out on that is is uh, is fantastic. 
Fantastic. Um, Jim, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, we got we got a few. Holly uh, asks, how open are new managers to being coached? Or is coaching more accepted in Australia than maybe what she's seeing in Southern California? Do you get much pushback can, when you offer yeah. that, Claire? I, I can take that. And people seem to love it here. <laughs> So no, we do, we don't really get much pushback. I mean, I've done many many coaching sessions. I think I've only had one or two people who have said, "Oh no, thanks." You know, like most people seem to be really open here. I don't know if that's Australia different or, but no, not, not so far. I think I think the challenge comes with uh, the challenge comes for some uh, managers and more senior leaders in uh, working out the priority and actually making this connection between mm -hmm. uh, truly human and strengths being soft and uh, achieving high performance. But I agree with Claire. Uh, when you offer this, it's people seem to be very open. So I'm not quite sure what's happening in Southern California. Maybe, not, uh, maybe And we're both surfing culture, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. <laughs> no, I know what's going on in Southern California. But in Accenture, Bob, we're very, we're very high performance, achievement focused. So we're just always looking to grow and get better, aren't we? So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's something yeah. in our culture. Yeah, a lot of Justin asked an interesting question. You know, um, there's a maybe a fine line be between being a high performance culture and being a tough culture. And how it has strengths in the last four years as you've been going through this, has it has it changed that in any way of being, uh, you know, of being a tough culture or being a, um, an aggressive culture? Has it made it any different? Yeah. So I don't think we are an aggressive culture. Mm. Uh, I think aggression, the word aggression is, you know, is, it doesn't necessarily need to be associated with high performance. By high performance, uh, we don't mean aggression. By high performance, we need, mean getting the best mm. out, of our, out, out of our people, helping people uh, bring their best selves to work and unlocking, I mean, unlocking the, the capacity that is often uh, lost through, um, through a lack of well-being. Um, so, so uh, our focus is on lock, on lock, unlocking that uh, tremendous uh, capacity that gets locked up through not caring for people, through not having meaningful conversations. So I would say what it's done is, uh, is actually helped unlock more capacity uh, for doing good and focusing on our purpose, which is improving the way the world works and lives. Uh, I don't think we had aggression to correct in the first place. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I, I truly been, I believe that I've been here 20 years and um, uh, you know, we're just about getting a job done and, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. focusing and getting that job done. I mean, there's a lot of maximizers <laughs> in a <expense, laughs> right? Um, and, uh, and our clients, our clients rely on that. What we have, I think this comes back, Jim. If I if I might uh, if I might also make the comment about the overuse of strengths, because this is something that I've learned uh, in myself, and it's a really important thing for all all of your listeners to understand that strengths. Uh, you know, it was Aristotle that said that strengths, when uh, either underuse or overuse, become vices. So too much courage, and uh, you're reckless. Too little courage, and you're and you're, uh, you know, coward and humor, too much humor and you can be cruel, too little humor and you're boring and I think too much maximizer, too much strategic. So it's really important for people to learn that. So maybe the aggression can come out when uh, when people are overusing their strengths. So if when we create the language of overuse and underuse, it helps people actually understand uh, when they overuse some of these strengths, that some of those uh, some of those negative things can come out. So it has helped us tremendously, I think, to soften. But it's more softening around uh, uh, helping people understand in the context of that uh, high performance DNA that if you want sustained, if you want to get performance, you've got to give the opportunity for people to work at the strengths of their passions and put them under challenge. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if you want to sustain that, you've got to focus on their well-being. Well, you know, I love I love an example of a high performance engine that if you tune it too hard, you'll shoot the pistons right up the block, correct, right? Correct, correct. And and so you need to find that sweet spot in the engine where everything is working properly and and that you've got it tuned properly for maximum, you know, horsepower that's in there. And so it's just a great that's kind of what I hear you saying. That's exactly. That's yeah. Exactly what I'm saying. We're tuning we're tuning our culture. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I, and I it's a process. Go ahead, Claire. I was just going to say, I find that people really resonate with that when I'm coaching. They really are interested in that, you know, how their strengths are overplaying, underplaying, how they can really invest in them because they're interested in growing. So, um, 
And then I think they find it less threatening because it's a it's a talent of theirs that they can influence. It's not about them. Do you know what I mean? Like I think it's helpful for them to name it something and say, well, that's my maximum. Claire just for yeah, we'll, we'll we'll bring her back. And here. how do I just <laughs> yeah, a little a little bandwidth. Claire, if you can hear us, you just locked up a little bit. We've we've got time. We'll we'll get Claire back in here and we got time for one more question. And let me throw that out there. Um, Bob, maybe you know. Did, did Accenture pull a complete top five? We did and, and uh, we did and uh, and I uh, I should know the answer to that, but Claire probably does know the answer to that. Um, but I, 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 uh, I would, I would be making it up right now if I. Uh, <laughs> Fair given enough. Integrity, given integrity is an important part of our values, uh, but <laughs> we can get that back out. We have done the analysis, and we do have those, uh, those top, those tops. Okay. Uh, well, well, go ahead, Ian. I, I would say certainly maximizers in there, and uh, and I would say learners in there. But we'll get back to the audience on that. That sounds good. Yeah. And Claire, let, or um, and let's do some final thoughts. Thank our guests for coming as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, Bob, thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate it. Um, and and I know how busy you are. I would love to be able to talk for another hour about what you know about well-being, about trust, um, and some of the other research that you've done. And I know that that certainly there's a lot of um, you know interplay between in, our engagement concepts and well-being. Um, and I'm sure that you could probably shed some more insight onto that. But that's got to be for another time, um, happy Claire. To happy to come. Back. And maybe why maybe Claire can answer that question, but. Uh... Uh, well, Claire, is there an Accenture top five? Have you guys pulled the team report of all Accenture to have a top five for them? No, she was there. Now she's. <laughs> she was there. She, <laughs> she looks there. great. Maybe, yeah, at least maybe she's looking for the top five right now. Oh, <laughs> she, she looks great. If you're going to go out, you have to at least go yeah, out yeah, looking she's great. Gonna be, she's going to be really annoyed with us. Yeah, no, I know. I know. I'm so sorry. Nope. We'll have to. Oh, oh, there she goes. Um, so Bob, leave us with uh, any last words. Do you have? Is there anything that you want to say? Sort of. Is there anything we should have asked you, or that you you wanted to say and didn't get a chance to to mention? No, I would say for anyone, if they want to contact us, we're happy to help. Uh, I want to thank Gallup for, uh, I would say, the reason we went to Gallup. So uh, this is not to advertise Gallup, but the reason we went to Gallup was because of the, the you know, the, the total conservation of assets and science that you have, but really the science. And we wanted to make sure that what we did was grounded in, in science. So thank you and, and the team for... Uh, for what you bring to us you've really you've really contributed to our our culture development and we appreciate that um claire are you are you awake now yeah i got what, what, I don't are, what happened to my what, internet what are, what are i lost my internet what are extensions top five strings oh um we we actually haven't been told so we we no. don't have data for accenture i'd love to get it to be honest i've asked I a few know. times i've seen some research maybe we did some research on anz i've seen randy did some stuff we'll, we'll get back to you on that we'll yeah back to you on that. yeah yes okay Fantastic. okay thank you very much claire any any other final thoughts for you too as we wrap this up uh, anything we didn't ask or anything you want to add here right at the end uh i don't, look i don't think so i think we've covered everything it's a journey we still got as we are maximizers, we've got more work to do. But um, for me, I don't know. Strength, strengths is is so impactful for well-being and engagement. So we're going to continue using it. Great. Well, if you guys will hang tight for me one second, we'll close this sure. up. Do you guys have a few minutes just to hang as as we do that? I do. Well, great. We'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available for them. gallupcom slash Strengths, a great place to go to sign in to get access to all this wealth of information that you guys are talking about. Uh, that's actually the portal into Gallup Access as well. So if you heard about these things, it's that that would be your entry point into the system. If you're while you're on the page, you can sign up for the Clifton Strengths Communities newsletter that's available there. If uh, you have any questions at all, you can send us an email coaching at gallup.com. If you want to follow us and these live programs and see the next time Anne is going to do another one of these, which, Anne, you're the best at this. So thanks for, <laughs> for doing, for doing these as well. You can follow us on Eventbrite, gallop.eventbrite.com. Uh, and speaking of that, anything that you want to add or anything that you want to highlight before I do the final close? 
Gosh, um, we have an awful lot of courses and things coming up out that are based out of Sydney. They're all virtual. So if anyone wants to, to join us, they can, regardless of what time zone they're in. <laughs> yeah, and check check out our brand new courses site, courses.gallop.com. And there's just, a, we, we're trying to make it easier for you all the time to be able to take our training. And for now, they are all virtual. I don't think that's going to last forever. I think eventually we're going to get back to seeing each other in person and and maybe the elbow bumps will be a little more common. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. Courses.gallop.com. Join us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash called the coach. And of course, you can join us on LinkedIn as well. Just search Clifton Strengths Trained Coaches and uh, we'll let you in that group. Thanks for joining us this morning, tonight, today, this afternoon, whenever it was for you. We appreciate it. If you're listening to the recorded version, we want to thank you for uh, downloading that and listening to it as well. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>